<laughs> okay, so uh, we are glad to have Dr. Orko Chatterjee as our colloquium speaker today. Orko did uh, his undergrad at uh, Krishnamurti Government College. He was a classmate of our SR staff, and uh, then he uh, did his uh, masters from uh, Presidency College. And after that, he went to the Center for Space Physics in Kolkata for his PhD. And after finishing his PhD, he did uh, postdocs for a couple of years at the Eisenberg Center. And then uh, he also uh, did postdoctoral work at two different institutions in Korea. Cheng one, one. Uh, well, UNIST. Actually, um, he was in UNIST, so my professor was from oh, CPND. Oh. So affiliated to the different institutions in Korea, and after that, he is now a postdoc at uh, University of Manitoba in Canada. And uh, Orko has worked extensively on um, X-ray predicting X-ray observations of galactic black hole systems, and so he will uh, talk about that. Orko. Thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, that introduction. And I'm glad to be part of here and presenting my work. Uh, the work that I'm presenting today here is largely based on uh, my thesis work and my first postdoctoral work. And there are building blocks that we will discuss today. Some of the building blocks were built by my seniors, and some of the building blocks were built by uh, myself. Uh, under the supervision of my supervisor. And something that we did after my postdoc, uh, starting my postdoc, that we will talk about later. So first thing that I want to discuss about this picture, it's a very old picture. It says it's Flammarion engraving. It's a wood engraving depicting our quest for knowledge. So here you can see this person is poking behind a curtain. This garden represents our knowledge sphere, and some person is trying to poke beyond that. And this tree here represents the tree of life. So this is a great depiction of our quest for knowledge, try to learn new things, and that's why we all are here. So our astronomy, or whatever we call it, modern astronomy, began with Galileo, and it was like 400 years ago. From there, we went to VLD in optical within 400 years. Not only VLD, we have extensive data for radio astronomy for 90 years, optical astronomy for 400 years, but just 50 years of X-ray astronomy. And why is that? Thankfully that. So our X-ray astronomy has to be happening in outer space. Otherwise we won't survive. So every mission, the space-based mission. We have uh, our atmosphere is like a five meter thick concrete wall to X-ray photons. Why? Because of photoelectric absorption. And we are really glad that that happens. So our X-ray mission started with Uhuru. It means freedom in Swahili. So Uhuru, we, we find a lot of sources named U. That U is from the satellite. So Uhuru is the first satellite, dedicated X-ray satellite, which captured X-ray photons, or rather we can say count rates, something like that, from a particular source, Hercules X1. So that's the beginning of our X-ray astronomy or X-ray physics, X-ray astrophysics. Then we have a lot of mission, ongoing, planned, it's a huge arena of missions. You can see a lot of red dots here, which are already operational now, like Grism, like ISP. Athena will be launched, maybe. I mean, so these are like at least two of them, when the paper was written, two of them already launched. That's a good sign that X-ray astronomy is blooming. And it bloomed once the X-ray satellite started to uh, go into space. So that's one of the good things that we have. 
since we are talking about black hole, we must have a definition of black hole. It's a very uh, 10 plus 2 level stuff that if we have uh, something very dense, compacted within a very small region, we can create a dark star. And uh, John Mitchell named it black hole. And for astrophysical or astronomical black holes, the mass has to be beyond three solar months. Otherwise, we call them, they can be neutron star and something like that. So it happens. We talk about solar mass, we talk about Schwarzschild radius, which comes from this, where your escape velocity is at the speed of light. The history of the word black hole, it came from Kolkata. You might be surprised. It came from Kolkata. So the tragic history, around 250 people, so 146, sorry, 146 British inhabitants were put into a cell, 14 by 18 feet cell, and only 23 came out alive. That particular thing in Bengali, we call it Ondhoku Hotta. And British people named it Black Hole of Kolkata. Now, some people say the word black hole in Bengali should be Krishna Gauhar. Now, I wonder whether it's the other way around, whether the Ondhoku is usually translated to black hole or not. Could be. So you can find this in this archive detail. And this stone, which marks, it was put in front of that cell. And then remove it. We will find it in Fort William. If you go to Fort William, there's a post office. If you go there, you will find this stone here. It was there. So the word itself came from Kolkata. And um, so yeah, being Calcutan, we should feel not pride. It's not about something to be proud of. But yeah, anyway. Connection. Some connection. Definitely, we cannot be pride, proud of that thing. So, in, in our context, what do we have? Black holes in our galaxy. So, there are different, different types of observation, observational methods to find black holes. Microlensing, Doppler effect, then astrometry, and then accretion and gravitational wave. Gravitational wave is finding black holes like in a bunch. Every day they are detecting something. But none of them are galactic. And be thankful about that. We are very thankful that none of them are galactic. Accretion is finding more black holes. So you can see 21 confirmed 65 candidates. Accretion is a very powerful tool to find black holes. And we'll study how uh, it can be uh, performed uh, to find it. So who can accrete black hole, white dwarf? We can skip a matter from binary company and interstellar matter, they accrete. It comes from Rochlow overflow, outflow from companion or tidal disruption events. So it can have many forms of accretion. So what happens when a galactic black hole starts to accrete or goes on to outburst? The thing that happens is, of course, the satellites, what they see is the photon counts in that particular direction suddenly increases 100,000 times. So you have a constant background count, and suddenly that background count is there, but your count is increasing many folds. It could be like 1,000 times more than what the initial count was. So these kind of things happen when a black hole or something goes into outburst. So here you can also see some glitch. This is a satellite glitch. That day satellite wasn't operational. So you see a glitch. Now you start to explain that, then it will be a difficult thing. It's a glitch. So what we do is we try to find some connection with physical parameters. But it happens. The so first thing that we'll address is what is extra time delays and how we do. So we see that there is a peaking thing that is happening in 2 to 10 keV band. Now, if you split that 2 to 10 keV band in several bands, then you will find and do cross correlation. 
you will find that something is lagging, something is going before that, and some part are doing some different, different, some energy bands are doing different, different things. So that kind of stuff happens. It's in time domain. Now, if you take a light curve one day, and that light curve you split into different, different energy bands, you can create power density spectrum. So power density spectrum, where your two light curves have same same light curves, you are taking the amplitude and ignoring the phase, you will find that there is sometimes there is a QPO behavior, and sometimes there's nothing. <laughs> and when we talk about lags or something, that means we are considering that phase part of that Fourier series, Fourier spectrum. So that phase part is providing some kind of lag or some kind of phase delay or something like that. Sometimes if you take two same series, it will not show anything because they are simultaneously going together. If there are different series, then we can find some lag or delay or something. But at what frequency? So that is very important. When we talk about lags, we are precisely talking about at QPO frequency not any other frequency, not broadband frequency, not uh, white band, not red band, nothing. We are talking about QPO frequency. So this is the lag that we are discussing or we will be addressing later on. And these lags can be in many forms. It could be a very good looking lag or it could be a complicated bunch with a lot of other things. So it can have any enormous forms. So that can happen. And we will try to address who's creating that kind of lags. So first things first, what is the radiation source from accretion? The basic principle is you have a potential, it creates a potential well. You, you are doing, you are going in the potential well, and from conservation, you are gaining kinetic energy, that kinetic energy is transferred into heat and that heat is translated to uh, your radiation. So that's the basic uh, assumption of accretion and radiation. So now in that particular case, we have to remember that there is a central field scenario <coughs> where for planets, we have an effective potential which is non-negative. After a certain distance, certain enclosure rather, it's non-negative. So there is something different going on here. And what's different going on here? For black holes, the temperature is very high, 10 to the power 7 to 10 to the power 8 Kelvin, which means 1 to 100, a few hundred Kelvin. So that's the temperature. The innermost stable circular orbit, if you put an electron, it will rotate at 0.5 C. Now, if you compare that to Bohr's orbit, first orbit, which is 1 by 137 C, is nothing. So you can assume, you can not assume, you can see it's very highly relativistic. So at that particular space, you have a frequency of 218 hertz for 10 solar mass. Fluid is completely ionized. Electron is free to interact with photons. And accretion is one of, not one of, the best process to liberate energy. For every gram, it will convert 5.7 5 to 42% energy into energy. Whereas your uh, nuclear process has a 0.7% efficiency. So you can assume, I mean, you can think about that the efficiency of accretion is very high. So it's the most efficient process to convert mass into energy. So we start with our first thing, which is the potential. This is the effective potential form around the Schwarzschild black hole. Yes. No, no, no. It depends on the curvature. So 5.7 is for shell, 42% is for extreme curvatures. So that's from the geometry. So we have 
So we have a particular potential form that is different from other cases. This particular term, ML squared by R cube, that changes everything. So you have potential going up, 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 and then it goes down. So if you can manage to overcome that barrier, there is no way you can get out of that system. It will suck you inside. So we have an effective potential. So if you are far away, your drop is lower. If you go closer and closer, you will radiate higher and higher energy. And then after a certain point, you will not be able to radiate anymore because everything is thin. So that's the horizon of the black hole. So we have our first painter, which is the effective potential. This effective potential changes everything. It changes the shape or the effective potential of the neutron star, white birds, planets. This is the key thing that differentiates black holes from those other objects. So also the n by r is gravitational. gravitation. L square by two r square is the what is the third time? Third one, yeah. Yeah, correction. So that is the effective potential for first elements. And this term is particularly doing everything that we see for black holes. But, but you said that it creates potential and it differs from planetary value. Yeah. All bodies would have the same kind of potential, except what is the importance of the DR correction that can depend on. Yeah. What kind of system we are talking about? Yeah, so okay. you know, are that's right. yeah, that, yeah. That. So since we have very small system, very compact system for black hole, and there's no hard surface, so there's no potential constant. So if we consider, suppose for R, potential drop will be up to R surface, and then it will be flat. But for black holes, there is no stopping point. So it will go down and down, eternal damnation. So that's our first painting. Now, there are a lot of things that meets the eye, but it's not everything. In any potential scenario, if you put particles, it will create orbits. So if you go here, it will create a circular orbit. If you are in between there, you will do a lot of transition. And then, if you are hitting that barrier, you will hit and go. And then, if you can manage to cross, you will fall inside. So how will you make it stable? So that you can have like year long, months long radiation. So that's where viscosity comes into play. So you have a central field problem. It's a pure central field case. Your angular momentum is conserved. So your particle will not enter. It will be on an orbit, eternally, like our planets. So you need somebody to transport that. That mechanism is viscosity. Also, you have to remember one thing. I say that kinetic energy is transferred into heat. But how? When any object falling on Earth, until and unless it reacts with our atmosphere, it doesn't glow. It can gain velocity, but it will not glow. So you have to have some friction in your system so that your system radiates. The kinetic energy will be transferred to heat, and that is viscosity. So we have viscosity. And what it does, it introduces non-conservative nature into your system. The force is not central anymore. So you have heating of the fluid, or rather, we should say, like the matter that is flowing in, it's fluid. It's not particles. So you have heating of fluid. It's frictional heating. Matter can lose angular momentum. 
If it can lose angular momentum, it can go inside. And then it generates torque, which means your motion is not bounded in pi by two plane. Once you have non-conservative system, you are not bounded in the pi by two plane. Your angular momentum is changing and you can do a lot of stuff. So fluid is not bound to Keplerian plane. It can move up and down, go anywhere. But again, the minimum potential regime will be in pi by two for any system. So what it does, it creates something which is an optically thick and geometrically thin disk in the pi by two plane because it's stable. Now, what it has, it has a lot of different, different radii, which is contributing to different, different black bodies, having different, different temperatures. So these black body or the envelope, we call it multicolor black body or MCD model. And this is the Shakura Shunai uh, first gave that in non-GR. And then the year later, it was presented by Keith Thorn and Novikov in, I would say in the same year, 73 itself. So in GR, full GR cases. So this is the Keplerian disk, which produces our most of the radiation. So you have X-ray regime, which is roughly 10 to the power 7 Kelvin, or temperature besides there, and you have stuff like that. What is the observational evidence of that? Viscous time scale can be obtained for outbursts in black holes from this cross flow relation analysis. So this delay that you see here is a measure of viscous time scale. How much time it took to raise the soft energy band. So you can clearly see the blue is hard. The blue, top of the blue is here, top of the red is somewhere here. There's a deal. Because Keplerian disk, it takes time to move inside. Because it takes D5, since it's going slowly, losing angular momentum, it takes time. For galactic black holes, it's within 10, 12, 15 days. If it's a big system, then it would be much larger. But if it's a very small system, like here, HTJ 155G, it's a very small system. It could be simultaneous, like within few hours, which cannot be resolved by RST. So uh, also, I cannot read that. Uh, sorry, I cannot read it. But what are those three colors? Three colors: red, green, blue. 1.5 to 3 kV. 3 to 5.6, 5.6 to 12 kV. With color bands. It's RC, ASM, T band, A band, T band, C band. And what are the, the y axis? Uh, y axis is the ASM counts. And second one? Second one is. Oh, so uh, three different objects. D yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's something, and then some. So three yeah. objects. Three objects. Three bands. Yeah. We are looking at the X-ray counts. Yes. So you know, Cross-correlating? Cross-correlating. We are finding that these two bands doesn't produce much of the delay. But when we are considering the lowest and highest band, it's producing a delay. Around, yeah. So it's producing the this blue curve, it's producing highest amount of delay with respect to blue and the red. And again, from here. Is it yeah. obvious for all the objects? No. It's not obvious. It's not observed yeah. in this object as well. So we, we say that this object has a smaller accretion disk. That's why we cannot see the viscous delay. So that's what we said. We are not sure about it. But why are you saying that the hard X-ray will leave? Hard X-ray leaves because first, so Keplerian matter takes time to come. The matter which is flowing below and above Keplerian level, or the corona, which is we are considering, it can move faster. Because that much angular momentum, since it's away from Keplerian plane, it can use angular momentum faster. 
it has higher gear compared to V-bar. So it can move faster. So that's why it moves faster, like wind accretion. Like wind is coming, everything is accreting from considering a spherical geometry for signal to response system. We have wind accretion. So wind is coming from every direction and it can accrete from wind. So it's a spherical geometry that we can consider. And Keplerian disk, it takes time because otherwise, since Keplerian disk formation is an isothermal process, it should have taken some time. Otherwise, there will be no disk. I mean, black body. But the non Keplerian is inner in the inner yeah. radius. So there will be some matter which flowed, like when the Rochlo overflow happens, some matter can flow, like from any direction. So that matter triggers the first few incidents of uh, like hard state spectra that we consider actually. It means a spherical accretion, like uh, what Bondi said, like Bondi accretion. Spherical accretion, because that is a more angular momentum. No, spherical accretion means zero angular momentum. It, it's directly informed. Correct, but spherical cannot happen for Rochlo thing. No, yeah, that's why that's why we are saying like first we consider the wind accretion, like uh, like solar coronal wind kind of thing, something accreted and then it happened. And also for Rochlo overflow, Rochlo is a particular point, so matter goes in and then it expands from the hotspot. It should expand. So in any way. Keplerian disk cannot start from the Rochlo Lagrangian like L1 point. Yes, That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That, point. That, that point. And then expands and then does a lot of kind of stuff. We don't do it. He's saying that a small fraction of the accretion flow can be non planar. And that goes more directly towards the black hole and that creates some RD. It's all speculative. Speculative. It's not nothing is confirmed. So, because the only thing that is confirmed is that Keplerian disk will take time. So that is that, that, that what what different different in the system mm -hmm. to have that one will form a your uh, this kind of accretion and another will go spherical. Uh, no, no, we are not saying that. One thing is that the where the angular momentum is maximum, it it will be in theta equal to pi by three, which is Keplerian disk. And that Keplerian disk take time. Otherwise, we will not understand any angular momentum we will have that will be always come to pi by three. No, that's what I'm saying. It should be maximum angular momentum. No, 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 no. Uh, why I'm saying that? Because it's like, since we have discussed flow, it has stopped. So that's what we are talking. It can leave the plane. Matter can leave the plane. It's not bound to a particular plane. Once you we introduce viscosity, it, it's not necessary that the matter will stay there. Matter can leave the plane. So if, if we don't do viscous flow, if, if you don't consider viscosity, any change to the Yes. You are reducing the angular moment, hmm. and the B is formed in the direction perpendicular direction to the angular moment. Yes, nothing to do with the magnitude of the angular moment. Hmm. Magnitude of the angular moment decides what is the radius of that uh, B. Exactly. So, when we say magnitude of the angular moment, we are considering like the theta equal to pi by p, that is the Keplerian angular moment. And if we do a cross section there, all the angular momentum that a flow can have, that LK is the maximum angular moment in the flow. Now we can have different flow, which is not in Keplerian plane, and that angular momentum will always be less than Keplerian angular moment. So the idea is the bonding flow. 1954's Bondi's paper, which has zero angular moment, that is spherically symmetric. 
we need to see. So we have second painter, which is viscosity. Of course, we cannot have anything without viscosity. And then when we look at uh, black hole X-ray spectrum, it has two parts. One is the black body, another is the power law. Now, who is creating the power law? The power law is created by inverse compromisation, and that inverse compromisation happens in the corona. Now, that corona is not bound to any particular plane or any particular place. Now, you can assume this kind of corona. You have a disk, and then you have a corona. Of course, there are some issues that we have in this kind of corona that we discussed earlier that the temperature is higher and it cannot sustain. But we can assume that this kind of corona is there. This is an electron cloud, which is interacting and creating this power law system. Now, the structure of corona is highly debated. People are really like, I don't know how to say that, but people are really doing a lot of stuff about that. So in our case, we assume the corona is a generally relativistic thick disk. So in that thick disk, we have the inverse polarization, and then our source of photon, which is a Keplerian disk, resides from the outer edge of the corona. And this corona creates various shapes of spectrum. So we have, this is the black body, injected black body from the disk. And then if we change temperature, the spectra hardens, which means spectral index decreases. So these are like some examples that we studied earlier. And it can be seen in uh, observational cases as well. So we can see this in Sigma 6 one case. This is a bad example because it's in EFE unit. Uh, this one is in uh, luminosity unit. But still, we can assume that. It can have effect on labs, the temperature of the electron coil. Now, if you look at this formula, this temperature theta E is there. And EH is the hard photon, and E soft is the soft injected photon. So you can actually correlate the quantization delay theoretically. You can calculate that. For a spherical cloud, you can calculate how much it will create. And that is observed in Sigma 6 1 paper, like uh, Miyamoto and Miyamoto Nature paper 1988. So that has some observed effect. And we can also see that from our simulation as well. So if we have that kind of structure, and then we do inverse compromisation, then it translates to the delays here. You can see more temperature creates higher delay here. So in a way, electron temperature contributes to both spectrum and time. We have our third painter, electron temperature. What was theta E in the previous slide? Theta E was electron temperature. Uh, theta E 18 by M C square. So it directly, yeah. so it has a relationship and you can actually do analytical relation, but non-uniform, it's a uniform problem. So it has uniform temperature, everything is uniform, not for or non-uniform cases. So we have our third painter, electron temperature. We have to remember that since we are talking about highly relativistic things, we must consider complete relativistic prescriptions. So we cannot consider uh, the claim, uh, cannot consider the Thomson scattering cross section. We have to consider the cross section, and then we have to calculate our uh, scattering cross sections for complementation. Now let's go to our next part. So the observed scenario is harder spectra at higher inclination. This is a classic paper showing how spectra or the disk hardens with inclination. So we can see the median or mean of this of this sample, low inclination sample, is much lower than this sample. That's one. And another part is the spread 
of high inclination fields is also higher than low inclination fields. So these are observational facts, which means the black body or the disc temperature rises as well as it spreads. So with higher inclination. So inclination means we have, uh, when we say inclination, we have, this is looking press on, this is zero inclination, and this is the disc inclination. Okay. That's that's something that's some model dependence. That's that's a lot of model dependence issue, and uh, there are dynamical process can be done. Uh, Munoz Darias is there. Uh, he does measure the mass of the black hole. So they use dynamical method. So what they use is that they measure the velocity of the binary companion when it goes to questions. And from that plane, they assume that this is the Keplerian plane of the accretion disk calculator. So from there, they can say that's the most direct approach. But the other approaches are model dependent, uh, like fitting with car BB or this black body and finding temperature and telling like this is the temperature. So it can be inclined to that. Or Renzil model is there for measuring spin and inclination. Loud is there for measuring spin, but all are model dependent. But the, this is model independent result. So this is a black body temperature measurement, which is only black body. We can at least say this is model independent. So we are considering that model independent. Now, there are reliable measurements for say phi C. So what happens to uh, timing scenario? In timing scenario, we see that higher QPO strength or QPO RMS is observed for high inclination cases. Soft labs are seen for high inclination cases. We will come to that later. Uh, so this is the inclination effect. What happens with inclination is that the photons are following a bent trajectory here. So with higher inclination, it can have different, different aspects. What we do is we solve 4D general relativistic null trajectory equations to track the photon. We have time as well as energy and everything stored in our system. And we use proper redshift formula, gravitational as well as centrifugal and projection effect to calculate flux and stuff like that. So using that, if we take a picture face on, we have this kind of shape for the redshift part, Doppler and gravitation. This is the ridge. You, you can see it's not changing anymore. If you go there, 90 degree, Doppler redshift introduces and it creates a butterfly kind of structure. Alpha, beta are observers, observer coordinates. It's like camera coordinates. So we have a camera. So these are camera coordinates. This is This is looking bigger. It's a bigger, it's for a this bigger. Is the difference in, this is almost zero degree inclination, and the next one was uh, 80, 80, degree. 80 degree inclination. So you can see a lot of stuff going on with higher inclination. Color code is for the red shift. So here, red shift is not changing, but due to Doppler effect and emitter observer frame transformation, we can see a lot of colors growing. Within the rotation, the rotation of 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 the rotation the rotation of 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 Nothing new in that. But what's new is that you can create this kind of parameter space with effective potential of photons plotted here, your redshift here, and put any energy there. It will create this kind of structure. Any energy, not only 6.4, anything, it will be like this. 
But why 6.4 is important? Because that's the most stable part. That's why it can sustain to that extreme gravity. That's why we observe. Otherwise, every line will have this kind of line structure. You're talking about the 6.4 6 point the iron line. Iron line. Everything will be like that. And then again, that parameter space, if we go on low inclination, it will be a narrow stream. There's nothing. So there's no effect of bending. There's effect of bending, but not that much significant with the Doppler and frame transformation. So when you say the redshift, you're, you're saying that it's the combination of the Doppler shift and the gravitational wave. Which one is the Doppler marking? Doppler is creating, yeah. Doppler is creating all those patterns. And gravitational wave shift is constant, depends on R only. So it will be the same with every inclination. So only Doppler and the frame transformation, since we have to the power four, that Doppler combined redshift goes to the power four when it goes to the observer. That's why it creates that more, that much intense pattern. So if we look at spectrum, we can see that 10 degree spectrum, black body part is much thinner than 80 degree part. 80 degree is much broader. This one, this black body is much broader than that one, which we earlier saw. And similar hardening scenario, we can see from there. So 10 degree is this one, and then it drops some and gets flattened. Here you can see it's very small, but it's around 30, 35%. And that drop of photon is transferred into this part. So we can see spectral hardening due to bending. So we have our fourth painter inclination and bending. It does a lot of stuff. That's, that was my uh, PhD thesis. And then we have black hole spin and reflection. It does a lot of stuff. We have prograde, retrograde orbits. I I don't know how much time do we have. Um, 15 minutes. Oh, 15. Then, okay. So what it does, it has a retrograde and prograde system. So once your matter is flowing this way, your black hole is spinning that way. That's the retrograde, opposite direction. In that scenario, you will have inner edge much outside. And then you have prograde, co-rotating. So in that case, inner edge can go as close as the Schwarzschild radius of the uh, curved black hole for extreme cases. So for both cases, different, different things happen. We mostly observe prograde orbits. There are very few cases of retrograde orbits because matter is tend to go around the like curvature. Like in Bengali, we say Gordanika Prabha. So it's like that. So there are lots of models to measure spin and that reflection component. So you can measure for different, different objects. You can actually correlate the residue pattern with the theoretical residue pattern. You can see the structure is more or less same. If you have higher, uh, I mean, larger X-ray telescope, if you have more photons, you will have higher chance of getting this kind of shape more prominent. But new star revolutionized this part, studying reflection and stuff like that. So it creates a harm. It also creates delay. It introduces D. So you have a corona, it's emitting direct photon, it's coming to you. Then you have a corona and radiating on this, then that reflection is coming to you. So that can happen and that can introduce a D. So for galactic black holes, it does a lot of complicated stuff. But for AGNs, it's a little bit simpler. Galactic black hole, you have known is that your disk is emitting X-ray as well. So it mess up everything. But AGNs, at least we know, if we consider standard accretion disk model, it's emitting UV or optic. So that's a CSP. But in galactic black hole, it's very difficult. So we have our fifth and final painter for now, spin and reflection. So if you put all of them together, you can create X-ray images of black holes. 
And apart from spin, we have considered everything to create this kind of images. So inside here, inverse quantized high energy photons, outside your Shakura Shunai or phase and form disk. And you can see this is the photon sphere, which is made out of only high energy photons, not soft photons. So that's one key aspect that high energy telescopes might be looking into later. Maybe. We don't have spin yet, and we are trying to do that. If we change parameters like inclination and uh, accretion rate, you can create a catalog of images. Now this catalog can be changed into more and more different different aspects. Like you can change it to you have different size of accretion disk, you have different size of uh, quantum cloud, different shape, your quantum cloud is elongated. You can have many things, but one thing for sure that we do this image alone has 1.11 no, GB of data. So what we run for one single case, it takes around 350 GB. So three cases, you can assume it's more than one GB data. It requires a lot of data. It ran for like 48 cores in 48 cores machine. It took about three days from inverse quantization, ray tracing, everything. But it takes a lot of data there, but it stores everything, like how many scattering, how many time, and what's the time of arrival map. So we can create lag map, which I can bet that no one else does, at least. Maybe not too necessary. Probably somebody will tell me this is unnecessary. So, but we do that. We keep that, we have that time of arrival map. So it has inverse quantization, number of scattering, everything included. Still, we can see that the far away photons are delayed. So that was my professor's idea of high inclination sources, why they should create a software. But anyway. So let's see what it does to time lag from simulation. This is from simulation data. So we have energy dependent time lag for two different sizes of quantum cloud. So we know that length scale can be translated to uh, frequency. So we have two different time scales and we can see with higher inclination, it's reducing. Higher inclination, the lag is reducing, but it's not inverting. It's not going to negative. For low inclination, we can actually simulate uh, different types of patterns. This is 50 dB case, GX 39 minus 4. It can create similar types of patterns, but it doesn't create high inclination cases like XTJ 1550 minus 56. So my supervisor was not happy about me that I was unable to do that. And he has written a paper that inclination will do that. He was really mad, let me tell you. But I was quite sure that no, it's not gonna happen because we are following everything that we can and spin cannot do that because the change spin introduces lies within six to seven RG and six to seven RG will not get generate this much amount of change. So if you look at the magnitude, you can see it's 0 0.02 to let's say 0 0.005. It's 0 0.025. That's a huge amount of delay. So my delay is like 0 0.008, something like that. Because of our system limitation, we have 50, 100 RG system. So if we do a little bit bigger system, it will be bigger. So mine is like 50 RG. So we have this. If we have like uh, 200, 200 will be good enough. 200 RG simulation will be good enough for generating that kind of magnitude. So we have that kind of structures, but fail to do that. So then when I'm writing, how's the simulator? 
No, that's observational data. That's observational data. That's observation. This is simulation. Our work is simulation. For example, No. That was the problem. And I was looking into the data and why it's not happening. And then I smuggled these sentences inside my paper. So it's literally smuggling the sentences because I already found that who at all reported some outburst happened this paper and they have radio peak going on. And I saw that it's actually coordinating with the lag pattern. So I smuggled this so that I'm okay. And then we found that it's doing a lot of stuff with spectral. You mean you smuggled this? Uh, in my in, paper. In your paper with the, uh, because your advisor was not. Yeah, he wasn't happy about it. But eventually he got the gist that this is happening because uh, yeah. when, we, when we did this work, we showed the data and cross correlation and everything. He was convinced that this is happening. So this is the XTJ 155 geo source. And you can see the radio peak is actually correlating with the time lag pattern. Remember that the time lag that we are talking about, everything is related to the QTO centroid time, lag, not anything else. So it's correlating. It's a fascinating thing to find. It's a model independent discovery. As I uh, discussed earlier, I presented this data in front of Andy Kapian and Chris Reynolds and Edward Caffet was there. So a uh, fascinating thing. It was in Fudan University, Cosimo Baptist Conference. So I later I asked uh, Professor Fabian that he has observing this. Uh, is it possible? He said that it could be for galactic black holes, but for AGNs, it's re reflection that he proposes that creates soft light. And truth to be told, I don't know about AGN that time. I don't know anything. Anything. So <clears throat> That was that. And then we searched for other sources and we find that, yeah, it can lead to similar kind of correlation, not that strong, but similar kind of correlation. And from hydrodynamics with outflow, we look into the simulations. What happens? So remember this pattern. It was 80 degree inclination. With outflow, it was half still not reversal. So there must be something else, but at least we know we reduced it. So that, that was happening uh, with the work that we did. So we conjectured that there is a part of outflow that is returning in the flow. That outflow, returning outflow, would again contonize some photons. So that photons may create the softening because we have to consider the length scale because of the time scale. So it cannot be very close to the black hole. It should be a little bit far away, which is contributing to the software. But this is high inclination cases. What happens when we talk about low inclination? So we have our inverse quantization delay, deflection delay, gravitational bending delay, and then you have Quantization in the jet. There is a plus minus sign. Why that plus minus? One minus we have seen for low in high inclination. It's reducing. But plus is something to be find out. It's in low accretion, uh, low inclination. We have in case of this particular source, we can see the correlating patterns of uh, lag versus energy. And that can be translated with PC and EH. Repeated quantum scattering, you can create a direct correlation from that relationship, which means this low inclination angle source is quantonizing inverse or whatever. It's quantonizing the photons and introducing more lag, which means it's doing inverse quantonization since the energy is increasing. So this is one particular case. So, this is my conclusion. GR is a 
crucial role when we are talking about galaxy black holes. It reduces the time lag magnitude, that's for sure, from simulation and observation. It broadens the spectra, like hardens the spectra, it broadens the uh, like black body component. And then jets and outflow plays a major role. Soft lag could be concurrent with uh, the radio flares. And for low inclination cases, it could introduce lag. For high inclination cases, it could uh, create, reduce the lags. So the big question is, what drives soft lag? We are ever grateful for Tommaso that we passed away. And without Tommaso and Tommaso software, these words cannot be done. So he is the pivot of timing analysis. Um, it's truly remarkable for the work that he do. So thank you. Okay, questions. Question. No, I, I have this one question. So, also uh, in the conclusion, you said that, uh, can we go to the yeah. sure. You said GRFX plays, GRFX plays crucial role in the spectral and timing properties of galactic black holes. So that I think is completely understood. I mean, that, yeah. that would be my Everybody. That's under, but I mean, yeah, that was it. In the conclusion, yeah. but what is the new thing you have? Is it with increasing? With increasing, uh, so I have three. So, once you keep increasing the increasing the GRFX become more and more dominant. And, dominant. dominant. Yeah. and it introduces, uh, like, decreases time lag magnitude and hardens the spectra. I mean, the hard energy photons are more focused. In, so, so, so why do we expect that GR to be more prominent if we are increasing the inclination angle? Mm -hmm. You know, think of. Uh, yeah. yeah. So it should be, ideally, it should be spherically symmetric because Correct. the potential is depending on R. R. But the source of the photon is not spherically symmetric, it's planar, Keplerian. That's what changes everything. So when we are at phase on scenario, the photons are focused like this. So we will not see any Doppler effect. We will not see any Doppler effect and the photons will go like this. We will just see the accretion disk size increased when we do back. But when we are considering high inclination, so we have a soft photon source here. We have electron cloud here. Now photons from Keplerian disk bends and focus more focused into the corona. That focusing effect leads to more inverse quantumized photons going to the observer who are in high inclination. So, 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 okay. It's the other way around. The GR effect is constant. The effect of the uh, Doppler effect is reducing when you are taken. Looking at the That's why that's why you are saying that the GR effect is wrong. Okay. Yeah, so, could be. I think that's a better interpretation because when you say that GR effect becomes prominent, that really we are thinking of stronger gravity regime. But that, is, that could not be the case because the black hole, the source of the gravitational potential is all the same. Yeah. So it's the opposite that GR effects are looking more prominent because of the cancellation yeah. or more. Depending on if you the face of thing, you are kind of fancy. I actually removed the spectral parts from here. Uh, there are a couple of things like that we discussed the spectral hardening and uh, speed of the spread of the black body from that. Yeah. Also, there is talking about the galactic black, but recent mm -hmm. work on the, there is a model by Tim Sweeney in the relative. Mm -hmm. So there will be an Asian spectra, but in, including with the uh, inclination effects and mm -hmm. so they see a similar thing and there's a dramatic shift in the area. I mean, most of the, they are even claiming that some of the Indian optical 
that we are seeing can, can actually be done for the one compromisation. Yeah, it, it can happen because down scattering. So there is not only sorry, there is not only up scattering. There are lots of down scattering happens. So you are emitting optical or UV. Then some down scattering happens in the electron cloud, and that photon is went into the optical region after down scattering because not all electrons in the electron cloud are 10 kV. There are 0.1 kV as well, 0.01 kV as well. So they can down scatter the photon. And that photon can have like it can create complicacy for delay or lag analysis. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you say that uh, uh, merge acting of the order of 0.002 and yeah. increase that uh, length scale to increase. Increase. Uh, why is it so? Because, uh, so, okay, let me get back to uh, this. will do, I guess. You see that EC is directly proportional to the R. 